Next, shall we give Arwell a massive Silver City welcome up here? Welcome, Arwell. Yeah. I, I think you're popular here, Arwell, eh? do you think? Um, let me introduce Arwell, because there might be some people here who have joined during lockdown and maybe don't fully understand who Arwell is. So Arwell was um, our pastor way back in, he came here 2004? Yeah. To 2009? Yep. And then they liked Aberdeen so much that him and Anne decided to stick around Aberdeen, right? Mm -hmm. Which, hey, we're delighted with because it means that we've continued to be beneficiaries of um, the gifts and just the, the things that Orwell and Anna poured into our church over many, many years now. Um, let me just say this about Orwell. Um, even in my time since I took over last summer, Orwell and Anne have been such a support to me. Um, I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure many of you would agree, that Arwell and Anne bring a wisdom and um, a discernment and just a, a real fatherly and motherly gifting in our church, which is unique. And so we're really just blessed to have you here, Arwell and Anne. We're looking forward to what you've got to share. Thank you. Um, Arwell's last speech, not to take off his notes or anything, was a while ago. And you had a bit of an accident in between times. Bit of an accident, You're recovering. Yeah, yeah we'll call it a bit of an accident. You've recovered in between times. You're still recovering. Um, and so we're so excited because now this gifting Arwell has is able to come back into our church and just strengthen it. So can I just pray for you, Arwell? Thank you. Why don't we just reach out our hands to Arwell? Lord, we want to thank you for this man and Anne, his wife. Thank you for the gift that they've been to our church for many, many years now. Thank you for Arwell's um, pastoral gifting, his apostolic gifting, his prophetic gifting. We know that um, you've used him in wonderful ways in the past, and we believe that your purpose is to use him in wonderful ways in the future. And we're just looking forward to what you have to share with us this morning. Bless him, Lord. Give him clear thoughts. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit takes hold of what you have to share and just ministers to us in a deep way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. I feel as if I've died and gone to heaven and listening in on my own obituary. <laughs> yes, David mentioned it's been a long time. I, I, I looked it up in my diary. November 2019 was the last time I preached here. <laughs> but I had a great message of encouragement from Frank during the week. And thank you, Frank. You continue to be a great encourager. Um, and I replied, I hope that preaching is like riding a bike. Once you've learned how to do it, you don't forget. Um, and I got a brilliant reply back from, a bit of advice back from, from Frank. He said, well, don't forget to put the stabilizers on the bike. By which he said he meant the faith and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? So um, you saw me go for the sympathy vote. I didn't, I didn't use the stick this morning. Um, so I've got stabilizers on. Hopefully I won't fall over. Um, I don't know if that was original, Frank, um, or whether you came up with it, but if it's, if it's original, I'll pay, I'm happy to pay you royalties every time I use it because I'll use it again. So my title this morning is, and apologies, no overheads. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very good with the technology and I'm not very good at uh, preparing, actually. Uh, <laughs> As Anne will tell you, I was, I was changing this in the last minute before coming. Um, anyway, the title, God's Glory Concealed, um, and I'll say a bit about that in a minute. And I described um, this morning's uh, message as more storytelling um, rather than a neatly packaged message. Storytelling with what I've termed some light bulb mo moments. Like, and some of you will remember this, um, perhaps not all, as mothers used to do at Christmas time with the Christmas pudding, they used to hide silver coins in the Christmas pudding for their children to discover with great joy. And you'd get a, a shout, yes, I've got one. And it would either be the silver coin or a silver filling falling out because they bit the coin. Um, so that's what to look for this morning. Like little silver coins in the mess of the pudding. 
I'll let you into this secret. I said I'm not very good technically. Typing this message, I looked for a little icon image of a light bulb that I could use in my notes to alert me to the fact there's a light bulb moment coming up, and I couldn't find one. Um, so I've used an acorn instead, uh, which I found, and I'm hoping that from little acorns, mighty oaks will grow, and that's, that's you, that you will grow in your faith. Okay, my 316, 2 Corinthians. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I think in her email announcing the service, Sheena said something like, um, that's a pretty unusual one, uh, and it is. Um, and I, I was just drawn to it. I, I went through all the 316s of the New Testament, um, missed out on the, on the obvious ones, and somehow this one just hit me. Um, but first, let me give you some context. Every speaker in this series has said how context is important, um, and it is for me. Um, there are two letters Paul wrote to this church in Corinth, uh, first and second epistles, of course. Um, a church he founded on his second missionary journey. So he's got personal investment in this, in this church and in these people. Um, so you're getting good, really good value from me this morning because I'm giving you one verse for two epistles. So, you know, that's bargain of the week. First title, and you'll see that I'm currying favor with the management here. My first subtitle is The Heart of the City. And um, I shall develop that as I go along. Firstly, Corinth, um, a city situated in the south central part of, Gre of the Greek peninsula. Um, linked to the mainland by a narrow isthmus, which is a strip of land that connects something that would otherwise be an island to the mainland, so it's connected to the, to the mainland. Athens was the main cultural center at the time, uh, but Corinth was the commercial hub. And as such, it was more important than Athens. Um, its wealth, built on sea trade with Rome, who at that time was the were the occupying power. Um, I describe Corinth in those days as a free port before our governments hit on the idea. It was known for wealth, for luxury, and for immorality. The population then, I'm, I'm told, was of the order of three quarters of a million, but astonishingly, half a million of those were slaves. Julius Caesar rebuilt it as a Roman colony and capital of the province of Achaia. And the isthmus that I've mentioned, that was a barrier uh, to trade because it required the larger trading vessels that would berth initially in Corinth then to undertake the hazardous circumnavigation of the Southern Cape, which was feared by many sailors. The, the seas and the weather were so rough and unpredictable but they had to do that to access the, the main eastern cities of Athens and Thessalonica and Philippi. Just to bring it up to date, a ship canal was eventually cut through the isthmus in 1893 and is still in use today. I expect Jim knows all about that with his maritime background. So what we see in this city is that a city's lure of wealth and immorality and false doctrines can infect a church with dire consequences. So that brings me to the church, the church in the heart of the city. It's no surprise that Corinth's reputation as unruly, um, hard drinking, sexually prom promiscuous, was shared by many of the original converts who came into the church. That was their background before they were saved. Eugene Peterson says, Conversion to Christ doesn't automatically furnish a person with impeccable manners and suitable morals. Uh, perhaps it's a pity that it, that doesn't happen. That could help many of us, I think. Paul had spent 18 months here after founding the church, grounding them in the basic foundations of their newfound faith. And in chapter 2 of the first epistle, he explains his approach like this. I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you 
except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration, demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What a great mission statement. And he fulfilled that. But having founded the church, invested so much of his time, energy, and love there, he was hurt to learn that in his absence, things had fallen apart. Cliques had formed, factions. Morality had been thrown out of the window. In chapter 5, he refers to scandalous sex practices in the church. Relationships had been fractured by legal action between members, taking each other to court and, in the process, washing the church's dirty linen in public. And worship had degenerated into a fixation on the spiritually spectacular at the expense of basic Christian truths and living. And to which I would add, churches today are not entirely immune. So his first letter, described as a classic pastoral response to seriously bad behavior, actually produced an angry reply. In the reply, we don't know who wrote the letter, but presumably one of the leaders of the church, or perhaps all of them. The reply attacked Paul's apostolic authority, suggested that he wasn't the apostle he said he was, attacked his personal integrity, and said that he had false motives in starting the church and now trying to keep it going. And that led to Paul's second letter that we're focusing on uh, this morning, um, in which he refutes their allegations and reasserts his right to admonish them as the founder of the church. Eugene Peterson again comments, for anyone operating under the na naive presumption that joining a Christian church is a good way to meet all the best people and cultivate smooth social relations, a reading of Paul's Corinthian correspondence is the prescribed cure. It's said that the church in Rome, in Corinth, caused Paul more heartache than any other. And when you read the epistles, that is saying something. So, let's take it on one step further. The heart of Christians in the church in the heart of the city. And if that doesn't get me brownie points with David, I don't know what will. <laughs> and turn to focus on the, uh, the, the today's message. 2 Corinthians 3, I'll read a few verses around verse 16. I'll read from verse 7, and I'm using the New Living Translation. The old way, lit with laws etched in stone, led to death, though it began with such glory that people couldn't bear to look at Moses' face, even though the glory was already fading. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life. If the old way, which brings condemnation, still was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? Hallelujah. On to verse 12. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face, so the people of Israel would not see the glory. Verse 14, But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is read, the same veil covers their minds, so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. And verse 16, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I'll try to unpack some of those um, issues um, in the rest of the message because there's some curiosities in the Old Testament that Paul is raising there. He's referencing, of course, Moses' ascent of Mount Sinai 
immortalized by Charlton Heston in Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments. Yes, John, got it right, have I? <laughs> and by my, my account, this is Moses' third ascent of Sinai. Now, we can't compare Sinai with Everest, I know that. Perhaps more Ben Nevis, but without the mountain railway. <laughs> but not bad for an octogenarian. Um, I'm nearly an octogenarian, and I stand, very shakily, in awe of Moses' feet. Um, I once made it nearly to the top of Cairngorm, uh, or Ben Nevis, but not to the top, and to do it three times when you're in your 80s, come on. And there he receives from God, from Yahweh, the Ten Commandments. But on coming down, he finds the people, his people, that he's leading out of Egypt to the Promised Land, he finds them engaged in idol worship. Come on, he's only been on the mountain for 40 days and nights. For him, that's an eternity because he was without food and water. But in 40 days, six weeks, they'd junked faith in God and gone over to worshipping a golden cow. Honestly, words fail me. Well, they don't. <laughs> words never fail me. <laughs> An acorn moment here for you. Mountaintop moments never last. They can be significant. They can be very significant, as I know in my own life. But they're not the norm of everyday living. Remember Jesus when... He took the three disciples out up the Mount of Transfiguration, and the glory descended upon him. And the disciples were so struck, so impressed, especially Peter, that they wanted to remain there and perhaps build a shrine there. And Jesus said, no, we've got work down the mountain. You don't stay at the mountaintop. But doesn't our enemy love to bring us down from the mountaintop with a bang? and to present us with something that contrasts completely with the experience we've just had. Think Jesus, baptized in Jordan, a voice from the Father in heaven confirming him as his beloved Son, the Holy Spirit descending as a dove upon him and empowering him for his ministry that's just being launched. And immediately by that same Holy Spirit, he's driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Think of Peter. He comes up with that marvelous revelation. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. A little later, he denies knowing Jesus three times. And Moses himself, brought up in a palace, a prince of Egypt, knowing the best of everything. He then has to spend the next 40 years in the desert, looking after sheep. I say to Pastor David, you and I are probably very glad that does not form a component of modern biblical training for pastors. Although perhaps sometimes it can appear like that. Anyway, he comes down the mountain. He sees the people bowing down to this golden image. Furious, he smashes the tablets of stone to smithereens. The Ten Commandments, that precious word, gift of the law, gone. He then has to set uh, some time setting matters right. But Exodus 33, which is where we read about all this, Exodus 33 and 34 are the key Old Testament chapters that Paul's referencing. Exodus 33 provides some wonderful insights into Moses' relationship with God. Uh, these snippets, verse 11 from Exodus 33, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. I am a friend of God. You are a friend of God. You have every right to expect the Lord to speak to you in your times of meditation and worship, face to face, because he's your friend. Verse 15, Moses said, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. But God says, I'll be with you. And wow. Wasn't he with them? Verse 18, Moses says, Please, show me your glory. And Yahweh responds, 
I will make all my goodness, that's interesting, isn't it? Goodness. All my goodness pass before you and, uh, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Better in the Hebrew. But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Beautiful, intimate exchanges. Put yourself into this story. Be Moses. See yourself in this relationship. The privilege of knowing the Lord of all the earth personally. And in, through that relationship, you're offered the precious gift of spending time in his presence. Personally, I'm not sure that I could ever bring myself to ask to see the face of God. I think I'd be too frightened by what God says to Moses here, and the example of Lot's wife as well. Now, I know that was disobedience on her part, but when she turned around to look, what did she see? Nothing, surely, but the power and glory of God coming down on Sodom, and thereafter, of course, she formed a, a salt-producing industry. And there's that scary scene in um, the film, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, when Indy's enemies capture the Ark of the Covenant, which he's found, they open it and they look in, and all hell breaks loose, literally. <laughs> so I think I'd be afraid about the face of God. Moses then returns to Sinai at God's invitation. And God hides him there in the cleft of the rock. Cleft of the rock, so often in Scripture, is a place of safety. And in the cleft of the rock, God puts his hand over Moses to ensure that he doesn't, even by accident, get a glimpse of God's face. And both of those are fruitful topics for sermons. Cleft of the rock, the hand of God on your life. And as Yahweh passes by with Moses in the cleft, Yahweh declaims, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. My opinion, what God says here is a part definition of his glory. He promised Moses, you wouldn't see his face. He didn't say you'd see my glory, but that was Moses' request. What God said was, you'll see my goodness. My goodness will pass before you. So I'd add goodness of God to the definition we're given there. Moses glimpsed only Yahweh's back. But even that was enough to make his face shine with unique radiance. And so that his brother Aaron, when he comes down the mountain, recoils from him in fear. And so Moses veils his face. Whereas we, we are privileged to be invited to see the face of God in Jesus. Jesus said to Philip in John 14, 9, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's a little bit of a mystery, I know. But Paul writes in our passage today, all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. I look round. I don't know your lives intimately, but I know some of you fairly well, and all of you a little. And I see, what do I see? I see Jesus. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus. Okay, imperfectly perhaps, but getting there, progressing, becoming more like him. Another acorn moment for you. While the glory of God on the face of Moses faded with time, with us it can be refreshed, 
renewed by seeking the Lord's presence. Transformation of our lives. What a privilege. By, by all means, therefore, be encouraged to seek the glory of God in your life. The theologian Tom Wright um, develops this point in his commentary on the epistle. He says, Paul is not referring here to the way we look at God or Jesus. The whole point of this chapter is about the way we see the life-giving spirit in the faces of fellow Christians. And he illustrates it like this. When the sun rises in the morning, it often strikes a neighbor's window before mine. His window reflects it right into my house. I look at my neighbor's house and see reflected brightness of sun. Yes, says Paul, we gaze at the glory of the Lord as in a mirror dimly, that's the NIV translation, but instead of being dazzled, we find ourselves being changed, like Moses, from one degree of glory to another because of the Spirit of the Lord working in us. Another acorn moment. Now, that's something surely to take away and chew on and to speak to the Lord about. But note these two further points. One, the purpose of the veil wasn't primarily to avoid causing fear. That may have been a consideration. But mainly to hide the fact, we're told, that the glory was already fading. And sometimes I wonder, is that why we try to hide from each other? Because we're aware we're not who we think we ought to be. And perhaps we're not where we used to be. And the second point, more important, when Moses met with God, he removed the veil. There's no point using a veil with God. We can't hide from God. He knows us intimately. He reads us like an open book. So my final heading, the two covenants contrasted. Um, I've mentioned the problems that there were in the church in Corinth. Well, as if that wasn't enough, there was another problem there, and one that Paul had faced elsewhere, notably in Galatia, and one which can infect our churches today, and that's the problem of legalism, by which I mean reduction of the Christian faith to subservience to rules and regulations, <laughs> bondage compared with liberty, spiritual death instead of life. Paul doesn't explicitly call out individuals in the church here, but the whole chapter is devoted to contrasting the old covenant of law with the new covenant of life in Christ, which suggests it was a major problem in the church in Corinth. Faults like promiscuity and factionalism might have been evident in Gentile believers because they had brought parts of the city with them in that sense. But legalism would have taken hold in the ex-Jewish community. Think of it this way. If you've been brought up to believe your Jewish faith has been handed down directly by Yahweh as a mark of his favor upon your people, and that gift is so glorious, you can't conceive of it as being temporary. Nothing could replace it. So when you come to Christ, suddenly, all the props supporting your life previously are kicked away in an instant. And that could appear quite scary to some, and tempting to embrace a teaching that tried to fuse both aspects together. Yes, life in the Spirit, but supported, bolstered by some handy rituals and some nice-looking rites and some rules that we can follow so that we know where we are. You get the best of both worlds, you think, except you don't. You'd lose both, because liberty can't coexist with legalism. The new way Christianity is life modeled on Jesus himself, indwelt, guided, empowered by the Holy Spirit. A vibrant life which contrasted elsewhere as a heart of flesh, soft-hearted, compared with a heart of stone. Or to use Paul's imagery, 
Instead of living an open-faced, open-hearted life in the Spirit, we put a veil over it, extinguishing the glory of God. A veil over our hearts, over our minds, hides the glory of God's new creation in us. It fails to promote the truth and lives a lie. It exchanges true freedom for slavery to rules. And it sinks into a directionless meander, a drift of God's purpose for our life, and misses out on the transformation that Christ offers us to become like him and reflect his glory. And what's more, and this is the clincher, it's unattractive to non-believers. No contest, Paul says. Dead letters compared with living epistles. Acorn. The same applies today for a believer who slides into a life of joyless observance of rules, thinking that's what following Jesus involves. It can happen if we lose the, Lord, sense, if we lose the sense of the Lord's presence and purpose in our lives. Or even worse, we may slip away into disbelief. Tom Wright again. Moses, while curator of the old law-based covenant, was granted a glimpse of God's glory and heard the message that, although wickedness cannot be tolerated, God was a God of mercy and love. And when Moses came down from the mountaintop, his face shone with the reflected glory of that experience and revelation, but the people weren't ready for it. They were afraid of it, so he covered his face with a veil. My final little acorn. Fear, too often a, a reaction in us to a new faith test. When the Holy Spirit shines a light into our life, into a dark corner that we're desperate to hide. Or an invitation from the Lord to accept a new challenge in life a new experience with God. Afraid, we hide, and we pull a veil over it. It was ever thus. Humans have a history of that. Adam, where are you? Moses, who are you? Elijah, what are you doing here? Paul's point is that even this glorious revelation that God gifted Moses is as nothing compared with the glory revealed in the gospel of Jesus, and through which God's Spirit is powerfully at work to bring life and vindication in place of death and condemnation. Personal relationship with Jesus, in whom we see the Father's face, and into which we gaze in love and without fear, replacing a hard heart of sin with a soft heart of love, in short, a love affair. Therefore, choose life. I'm finishing. I've attempted to cover two bases this morning. For those of us who know Jesus as Savior, I would encourage you, encourage us to draw closer, go deeper, climb higher. But as well, anyone who hasn't yet come to faith or may have fallen away, I pray a general prayer in a moment, but I invite anyone who's been touched by anything I've said, or hopefully the Spirit has said through me this morning, please speak afterwards to someone you know, someone you respect, and ask them to pray with you. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace in our life. We thank you for your salvation that has set us free from the past that otherwise would contaminate our future. Thank you that in you we have not only an example and an inspiration, but an empowerer. And we know your heart for us, your desire, strong desire for us is that we should be with you, should be like you. And we bless you for that. And I thank you that I can see it happening in individual lives. But Lord, there uh, may be others who perhaps feel they're lagging a bit behind. And I ask, Lord, that you will touch them, not with condemnation, because we know that doesn't come from you, but with invitation to draw nearer, draw closer, 
to get to know you as a friend face to face. And I pray, Lord, that with our multiple needs this morning, as we address you and as we strive to worship you, that we will find you in a new way, in a fresh way, in a deeper way. And as a result, we'll become more like Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And now, at this point, and I really am closing, one or two of the more percipient among you may be saying to themselves, he's been talking for a long time and he hasn't even got to his text. At this rate, he'll still be talking when the Lord returns. Fear not, O ye of little faith. 316 is part two next week. Yes, we have that to look forward to, don't we? Part two, a sequel, which is going to be really great. You know, um, as someone who's been writing a fair amount of sermons over the last year, I often think if I can communicate one thing um, in a sermon that is worthwhile taking away, <laughs> I usually feel quite chuffed with myself. But Arwell's given us so many things there in what he shared with us, these little acorn moments, as he's called them. And in our Bible reading plan this week, Nikki Gumbel says, um, an oak tree is just an acorn that stood its ground. And I love that. And these thoughts that Arbel shared with us, these acorn thoughts, various different things throughout as he shared this morning, there'll be some that are relevant more than others for your life probably. But I want to encourage you to go away and think about what he shared. Obviously, our sermons are all on YouTube now pretty much on a Sunday afternoon, roughly, so you can go back, re-listen to it, and really squeeze out of what Arwell shared with us, what the Lord has for you in this. There was a few that just spoke to me really deeply. Mountaintop moments never last. Isn't that helpful? Thinking about that, because when we find that the, the mountaintop moment is fading or it's time to come down, we can think that, that there's something wrong but actually, no, they're not meant to be lasting indefinitely. I think even that simple insight can really help us. Um, and I just loved what you shared, Arwell, at the end about for those of us who know Jesus as our saviors, we have this hope within us that we, we can meet him face to face as a friend. And as we do that, our lives are transformed and we do shine brighter. And like Arwell said, if, if you don't yet know Jesus, if you don't yet know him as your savior, as the person who died on a cross for you to save you from your sin, then we'd love to talk to you about that. So please, come and speak to me after the service. Speak to someone else you trust that you know. And we'd love to just meet with you, chat with you, and pray with you. So thank you, Arwell. We're looking forward to next Sunday to hear the second concluding part of that. Hey, we're going to sing our last song, and we're just going to um, close our service after that. So shall we stand and do that? How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadow of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ My living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To where my
my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the side. Yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my